Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. It's not easy to strike a balance between regulation and economic growth. Workers expect to be protected and the EU also has plenty of regulations to honour if it's to meet its targets on the environment and net zero. But businesses also need to grow. My guest today says that they're being held back by excessive red tape as well as by other factors. That's not only bad for companies, but it also hurts the EU's competitiveness compared to China and the US, according to Marcus Beira. He heads Business Europe, the largest business organization on the continent, which represents national employers, associations and companies. And he joins me from Brussels. Uh, Marcus Beira, thank you so much for being my guest. Now, uh, your members are saying that the EU has a problem of attractiveness, of attracting investors, and things are not improving, apparently. Well, we run a report called, uh, called uh, European Reform Barometer every year in spring. Uh, so the result last year was that 90% uh, that, uh, of our members were saying that the business location is worse off than three years before. And the result of this year was that the situation has not improved, has continued to slightly decline. So there's an issue, and we see it in all figures. We see that more investment happens outside Europe than in, than in Europe. We see that we lag behind in growth compared to our major competitors, and we also see that we had employment in industrial production declining. So we have a problem. The industry location is under pressure, and we'll need to find answers to this. So you mentioned several factors uh, behind this uh, stagnation, and that includes excessive regulation and lengthy permitting procedures. Maybe we can just focus on that for a moment. Well, we ask our members what is the reasons for this development. And the reason number one is, of course, the too high energy prices. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a, a very important reason. But then our members talk about regulatory tsunami, meaning that we simply had too much bureaucracy uh, falling on our members in the last years. And we have too lengthy uh, permitting procedures in order to uh, make industrial investments and the infrastructure investments happening. Yeah, and uh, the European Commission keeps talking about simplifying procedures, and actually uh, it talks about reducing reporting requirements by 25%. Uh, but you're suggesting that the opposite is happening, right, if you're talking about a tsunami of regulation. Uh, perhaps we can take the concrete example of the Corporate Due Diligence Directive, which has added these reporting requirements on companies that you say is unworkable. Well, I mean, this target of the European Commission to reduce the regulatory burden via reporting requirements by 25% is, is highly welcome. This is a step in the right direction, as are the Net Zero Industry Act or the Critical Raw Materials Act. But, of course, there are still too many other points adding burden, and you rightly mentioned the, uh, the, the CSDDD uh, directive, uh, the Due Diligence Directive, on which we have always been ready to, to take up responsibility, and our companies are taking responsibility in all the markets they invest. But we always said the solutions need to be workable and uh, need to also work for companies. And uh, what we have at the table now and what is the result of this uh, compromise that has been found in Coribe a couple of weeks ago is simply not workable and, we, and imposes obligations on European companies in a unilateral way uh, with the risk that uh, some companies might leave markets in Asia or in Africa. I, I was going to ask you about that. Is there, because you, you do say in your um, Rebooting Europe uh, document that, there's a, that European companies could pull out of global uh, operations. So we're back to this, this question of competitiveness. But is there any evidence of that already? Well, there's clear evidence of this. I mean, I, 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 I cited it before. We see that already before the, 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 the exogene shock, what was the war in Ukraine, we had uh, the investment flows going outside of Europe, meaning more investment happening outside Europe than in Europe. Mm. And we also see that industrial production is declining. We see that uh, employment in, in the industrial uh, production is declining. And we also see that we are falling behind our major competitors as far as growth is concerned. You know that Europe will grow by 0.5% this year, the US by 25 and China, of course, even higher. But more important than this, if you look at the last 10 years, 
uh, in seven out of these 10 years, the, the U.S. growth was significantly larger than in Europe. So we so, have an issue, yeah. but, uh, and we need to find solutions what, to, to, to redress the situation. What is the solution then? Is, is it to push back on these environmental standards, which are in the background of these directives, like the Corporate Due Diligence Directive? Well, no, the solution is to, I mean, first uh, find the balance in these pieces of legislation. And as I said, we were always ready uh, to, to, to be part uh, of a workable solution. Like, for instance, we have been in the forced labor directive. This is also something which will impose uh, burdens on companies. This will not be easy to implement. But we, on this one, we have been on board, not only on the targets, uh, but also on the measures because there was a clear attempt to find a workable solution for business. Just in looking at... diligence, what the, the solution that was found, as we see it and as our members see it, is not workable for business, and therefore is a bad compromise. When I look at your document, A Resilient European Union, you've got uh, seven points there with sort of the main policy prescriptions that you promote, uh, there's nothing that directly mentions the environment. And there's, I would say, an emphasis on moving away from a regulatory approach. So environmental groups would be pretty concerned, I think, reading that. No, what we want is, and, and it's very clear, we have always been uh, supporting the Green Deal, and we have always been supporting the targets of the Green Deal. But what we are saying is we see that we are losing out as far as global competitiveness is concerned. Mm. And therefore, we will need to complement the Green Deal by an industrial deal. Yeah, I was going to come yeah. on to that because we saw 850,000 manufacturing jobs disappear, according to the European Trade Union Confederation, between 2019 and 2023. What jobs do you want to create? Is it those jobs that disappeared or a different kind of industrial job? Well, I think there is, we, we need to do both. It's very important that we create jobs in the new sectors, and, and this is why we are fully on board in, in generating uh, the, the, the investment conditions for, uh, for new industries and for, uh, for green industries and, and for, the, for the transformation. But we also need to make sure that we do not lose more jobs on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, so what we need is not only create the green jobs, but to green the whole industrial value chains. Because we will only be successful if we are able to have successful value chains in Europe. So to bring, I mean, as you see, as you show the windmills, uh, to bring an example, it's very important that we invest in renewable energy. It's important that we produce the technology and the technology is not just coming from elsewhere, but it's also important uh, where the steel to produce these windmills comes from and where the turbines are mm. produced. So what we need is to transform the whole value chains in a way that we will have successful value chains on European soil. So does all of that start with retraining workers and people having new skills? Is that what your companies are lacking at the moment? This is another thing, and, and, and we just had a meeting with the Americans yesterday, and they said if there was not all these other big problems caused by the war and cost of energy, this would, of course, be the most pressing issue, because all our companies tell us that they lack skilled labor and they lack, uh, lack skilled people, so this is a big concern. Uh, and uh, we are uh, satisfied that the European Commission has come up with an action plan uh, to address this topic, because this is one of the most burning issues. And the issues we are asking for is we need to mobilize the inactive in order to bring the people to the labor market in Europe, which could be in the labor market. We need to facilitate intra-EU mobility. And we also need to, uh, to attract the qualified labor from third countries we also need for our labor markets. Yeah, let's break that down. I mean, firstly, uh, on the action plan, as you know, there's been this European year of skills that's been going on. Uh, do you see that actually bringing any concrete change or is it a more sort of public relations at this point? Well, the European years of skills comes to an end. It was important because the, the issue was discussed. But we have higher expectations towards the action plan because, I mean, it was just presented and we are now discussing the details but it puts the finger on the right issues. So as I said, we, there's many people in Europe who could work 
and are not part of the labor market, partly because the circumstances are not there, partly because maybe the incentives are not always set in the right way. So this is something we need to have a look at. What about labor from outside the EU? You touched on that. What kind of skills do your companies need from people that are outside the EU? Well, if we, if we look at, and, and of course it's a mosaic. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much uh, activating the inactive. It's about training and retraining the people we have. It's about intra-EU mobility, but it is also attracting talent from where we can get it. And, and of course, the issue will be, this will need to be more precise than it has been in the past. We will need to find ways to attract the hands and brains we will need for our production processes and we want to have as part of our labor markets. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much to my guest, Marcus Behrer, Head of Business Europe. That's all for this part of Talking Europe. In part two, we'll be going to Romania, where the EU election campaign is heating up.